going to do for you, I can make sure that we will definitely uh, intelligence. Okay. So, so that's how it's defined. And really, that still is sort of the case, right? We don't have clear definitions of intelligence. Um, there are some guidelines we use. Um, and it really is meant to say that the systems that we build, the robots that we build, um, are greater than or equal to uh, the capabilities of humans. Now, practically, what does that mean? Okay. Practically, it, it amounts to, I would say, two things, right? Intelligence. Um, there's there, there's some heuristics to this. So the first thing is it's not so much what you know, but rather how quickly you can learn something. Right. So for example, there's um, a study that was done on uh, in dog breed intelligences. Now, of course, everything is a distribution, and you will have some dogs, uh, so, some breeds that you would never think were that intelligent, but given the nurturing that they've had, the upbringing that they've had, they're quite intelligent. So there are problems with the study, but the, the measuring that was used was interesting. And what they came up with is they said, uh, we're going to classify dog breeds by the amount of times we have to teach the dog uh, a particular action and how long, how many, how many times do we have to repeat that? How many times do we have to repeat this, uh, this teaching for the dog to have like a 90% success rate, okay? And it's quite telling, right? So what they did is in fact, let me see if I can pull this up for you. So, so dog intelligence breed. And what was found is that certain dogs can understand basic new tasks within 10 iterations, okay? You'll see in computer science, we'll call that epochs, right? But, um, let's see, sorry, let's see, let me see if we can find it here. So, and uh, Wikipedia Intelligence of Dogs. Yeah, Corin did this. Okay, so let me pull this up over here for you. Okay. So, <clears throat> What they found is, you know, these dogs tended to have, um, you know, understanding of new commands fewer than five repetitions, obey first command 95% of the time or better. And, and it depends on what the commands are, right? And so, and they go on to say, how long did it take per repetitions? Now, having a dog, and I'm sure a lot of, a lot of you in the audience have dogs, there's, there's a lot of factors here as to how this happens, but if you control the experiment, um, there's something to be said about this. And so uh, my personal experience, um, I, I happen to have a Border Collie. I, I, um, we got our Border Collie before I read this article. Um, and uh, he is smart, but his, you know, his brother and sister are different, right? So they, they have their different personalities. These things are distributions, right? So, but I can say, and this is another you know, tip, if you're patient and you, you pace how you give them commands, you'd be surprised what your dog ends up learning. All right, so we were very into this and my, you, you can, we're on YouTube. So if you do CRYPTO space Frisbee and dog, um, you'll see what we've been able to achieve during the break. If you'd like, I can pull some of that up and, uh, crypto and I competed, um, in the Northeast regionals for, uh, something called, um, Frisbee freestyle. So we do like these Frisbee tricks and stuff. Um, he's a Delta society dog. So I've been able to take him into hospitals and, and so how do you get there? Right. And you'd be surprised because I have also seen very brilliant dogs from breeds that you would not think are supposed to be that smart. So for example, I happen to know a Jack Russell Terrier who would run circles around most of these dogs, right? So, so much of it is also what the owner has put into play. But the, the, the point being here is it's how quickly you can ascertain this information. 
right? So, um, and you'd be surprised. Just um, one more thing on this point. Uh, there's a trick that uh, I never thought he'd be able to do. And, I, and it's not even that fancy a trick. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of the silly trick, but I wanted, you know, like it, it was different. And what I mean by that is when you're working with your dog, uh, if you, you know, they'll circle you so we can catch that behavior. When they circle you, you can say, okay, you know, round or circle, and they'll understand that. Okay, they make that association. But so that's called catching the behavior. But how do you get them to do something completely different than what they want to do and then recall that, right? How do you give them keywords so that they do it? So um, I, I wanted him to be able to uh, show like he was limping. I call it one leg, right? So he'll, he'll lift his leg like this and just kind of put it in this paw mode. And I, I was actually inspired because if you, um, if you view, let's see if I can do this. Border collie. Uh, yeah, and has anybody ever heard of the geese police? Anybody ever heard of these people or this, this, this group? There's a, there's a um, um, franchise of dogs called the geese police. And what they do is, uh, yeah, this is a pretty good example. Let's see if I can do it. Yeah, this is what, uh, this is a pretty good example of it. So. Um, the geese police are a franchise of dogs, open a new tab, that police airports uh, and they chase off the geese so that they don't uh, impact the uh, airplanes as they take off and land. Um, very similar to like what happened with Captain Sully, right? They were geese that came through and caused a, uh, uh, an emergency landing. But the thing is, you see this posture how the dog has this stare, unwavering stare. And in the animal kingdom, eye contact means like, I'm not afraid there's going to be a battle. Um, and it's judged, weakness is judged by wavering eye contact. You know, when an animal is being submissive, it won't look at you. It'll just, you know, be in, in your presence. And if an animal is trying to be uh, aggressive, if the situation presents itself, it'll go eye to eye with you. And um, you can see here they're eye to eye. And what happens is, is certain breeds of dogs have this built into them and they call it the stare. And that means to the geese that, hey, this dog doesn't want to play. This dog is ready to hunt, right? And so, um, so he had this to begin with, but he didn't have this paw move, right? This is where I was inspired by him. So I said, how do I get him to do it? So what happened is, is I was just really, really patient and, and I had read this article about how many trials it takes. Okay, so I said, let's just see what it takes because it's not a, not a natural move, not, not for my dog at least, it wasn't a natural move. So I said, how, you know, how are we gonna do this? And so I you know, hold the Frisbee and I took his leg and I lifted it up a little bit and I said, one leg. And he looked at me the first time like, what is this? Give me the Frisbee, okay. So, uh, and I, I just was like, okay. And I give him the Frisbee and, I was very patient and I counted, counted. I said, how many trials is this gonna take? And you know, you can't just keep going because eventually their intention span wears out. They get tired, they get frustrated. So what I did is I said, I'm gonna go to 10 to 20 and we'll keep trying. And when I sensed that he was frustrated, I'd say, okay, that's enough and we'll go do something else. And ultimately over, it took about two, three days and it took me a total of 50 trials. I counted it, okay? So 50 trials over two to three days. And he now has this at basically 100%. I can say one leg and he will lift that leg up and get into that posture for me. So something to think about, right? The more patient we are, and, and it, it takes days with dogs to learn these behaviors. At least it took days with my dog and it took up to 50 trials for this unnatural behavior. Some things come much faster. So, and yeah. So to me, a key factor of intelligence is not what you know, but how quickly you can ascertain what's happening. Okay. So when these robots come about, it's great if they understand a lot, but it's more important if they are able to do things and adjust 
to, to new phenomena by learning the situation, right? So, okay. So AI, right? Machine learning is a subset of this where we don't aim for the systems to be able to do what humans can do, right? Or greater than or equal to what humans can do. Um, but we aim for the systems to be able to learn basic patterns as opposed to patterns of, you know, how do I climb the stairs and go help the crying baby? Uh, more like how do I figure out what this data sets patterns and correlations are automatically. And so uh, the idea is the more you run these algorithms and the more data they're exposed to, the smarter they get. Right? And, and a key point here, uh, and it's, it's not really talked about, but, uh, and it's a subtlety, right? But in the past, um, there, there's, okay, there's really two ways to build software systems. There's two attacks, if you will, okay? Um, the first one is, and let me see if I can draw this out for you, right? The first one is, um, let's do this over here, rules, okay? And these rules are, you know, if, and then, can you all see what I'm writing on the screen, by the way, just to be sure? Yeah, if you can, um, well, if you can't, someone say that in the chat. I believe it's rendering, so hopefully this is going to be seen for you. So, um, and this is how programming had, has been going on for the ages, okay? We would look at a phenomena and we would say, oh, okay, let's, let's ascertain what the rules are. Uh, let's figure out what these patterns are. And we would employ statisticians and mathematicians and software engineers, domain experts. We'd all come together and um, we'd model what the phenomena is. Uh, and the mathematicians and statisticians would pass down you know, their, their understanding of the system with math um, to the domain owners and the, the domain owners would can say, yes, this is correct. We'd run simulations and then we would try to build a system to automate uh, that phenomenon, right? So that we can predict it, understand it, uh, you know, go back in time as to why these things happened and uncover what's going on. So we build these models. And, and again, the way we did that is we modeled it and then we coded the mathematics and the processes that were agreed upon into software. So, um, and, and over time, what happens is, is when the rules change, when the parameters let's change or the sensitivities change, or we need to add a new variable, a new factor, we, the humans would go back and we would update these rules. So now there's a, you know, a new set, okay? And we have the people who are coming in and um, you know, they're gonna come in and they're gonna write this for us, okay? Uh, and so that's what happens. As the rules change, the programmers come in and they you know, constantly are coming in and rewriting these rules for us. And this is how most of programming has been going on, okay? So the big difference now is we don't, or we're trying with machine learning to avoid having these programmers come in and update the rules for us. Instead, what happens is, is we, send, we send the machines all this data, okay? And the machines look at it and they uncover what the rules are, right? And it, you, for those of you who were here yesterday, we had a decision tree where we were looking at basketball data and what happened, the basketball data, the, the decision tree uncovered what the rules were by itself, right? And what happens is, is it's gonna predict whether it's a win or a loss. Now we could have created a, a system to do that and we could have analyzed the data ourselves and we could have used partial differential equations and used uh, statistics to analyze the situation and we would have arrived at possibly a similar model, maybe a better model. And then we could have coded that in Python, R, Java, whatever, and had it predict it's a win or a loss. These are the factors and, and here is whether or not you're going to win or lose. But instead of doing that, we had the machine learn 
the patterns on its own, right? That is what this is really about, right? As opposed to the people learning and in putting these rules-based systems together, we're now having the machines learn and come up with the code that we would have written by themselves. And it's quite amazing. It's quite amazing. So um, part of that is because there's just too many rules to be found. Even in the basketball data set that we looked at yesterday, to have found all those combinations with the particular parameters for whether they win or lose is almost insurmountable for human beings to do. There's too many combinations, right? But combinations mean nothing to the machines. They will blast through it, right? So that is the essence of this, right? Machine learning systems look at data and derive the rules. And as the data changes, they go back and look at the data and they get new rules, okay? They, they, the machines learn it themselves, literally. They learn it themselves and outcome the rules of the system. With rules-based systems, people-based systems, we look at these patterns. We analyze these patterns. And we say, okay, these are the rules. Let's code it. Right? And as the rules change, we have to go back and pay the programmers or do the programming ourselves uh, and update these systems. So they both have their pluses and minuses. And they're both, you know, we may never be entirely machine learning because there are some systems that require such context that it's difficult for them to figure out. Um, for example, right now, the machines have still not figured out speech like we have it. Um, they can't uh, understand context like we understand it. They're not out here teaching classes or making decisions on ethical boundaries or solving the Minsk Treaty, right? So, um, but not yet, at least. You know, I, for one, am an optimist on these things. So, but I will also say that we don't know where it will go. Right, this, this idea that they'll become super intelligent and there'll be a, um, a sing singularity moment. Um, it's possible, you know, for, for me to say that that can't happen would be uh, fishisa. Uh, well, it would it, it'd be incomplete of me to say such a thing, right? Because it can happen, we don't know. There's too many variables. What I can say is that their abilities are quite staggering so far. So, okay, so that is the essence of machine learning, okay? The machines figure out the patterns. Deep learning, okay, is uh, a subset of this machine learning. It's still the machines figuring it out, but it does so in more of a trial and error way. And this is a subtlety, right? You'll, you'll see this as you start to develop these models, but let me see if I can unearth it for you. With, with classical machine learning, like the decision tree that you saw yesterday, you have to line it up for the machines. You know, you have to say things like, um, let's say over here, like you have to say things like, I think you need to look at these factors. Okay, so we'll say factor zero to factor I. Right? And, um, and then what happens is, is not only will you have to give them these factors, but perhaps you have to give them the standard deviation of these factors or the percentage growth, right? So there, there are all these statistical um, calculations that need to be made so that the machine can understand the phenomena, okay? And this is such a big, uh, task that we call it something. Anybody know what this is called, by the way? Anybody uh, um, been through this, uh, having to reshape the, uh, the variable so that the machines can understand it? If not, you can, you can put it in the chat, but I'll, I'll tell you. So this is the, uh, very good, uh, Feng Xia. Is it, is it Feng Xia? How do you say it again? Uh, it's Fengxia, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so it, what the, we call, var in machine learning, we call variables features, but make, make no mistake, features are just variables, okay? And they map to columns or however you brought them in. 
I like to think of them as roles and columns. And this concept of having to, or this task of having to come up with different versions of these features, additions, um, enhancements, clarity of the features is called feature engineering. I'm running out of space here, so I'm gonna feature engineering, okay? And this is, let's say you have 20 variables, 20, 20 features. And for each of them, you're gonna calculate the standard deviation, uh, the percentage growth over maybe the last time you looked at this, uh, and maybe the seven day average, right? Or, or maybe you'll have a, a regression uh, line where you'll, you'll, calculate, you'll calculate the formulas uh, for what the, um, what the curve that fits it is. And so you, you have to calculate all of these features, all of these enhancements, if you will, for each of those features. So let's say there's three. So now you're talking about 60 features. And then, the, you know, but then you get into, well, maybe I shouldn't have used the standard deviation. Or maybe I shouldn't have used the average. Maybe I should have used the mode. Or you know, maybe we should have used a, a different calculation. Or maybe we should have used a different uh, equation for the regression. And so you go back and forth, back and forth, trying all these different combinations for the features. And ultimately, you'll get something that's pretty accurate. And you, you, you may be happy with it. And then you move on. And you, you, there's so many mathematical properties that we can come up with. But at some point, you draw the line. OK. This task is incredibly tedious and requires going back and forth, back and forth with the domain space, um, because there are things that they may say, oh yeah, you need to look at the standard deviation. Um, or they might, or you may have uncovered something that they've not even thought about yet. So it's a lot of this back and forth, a lot of this calculation, okay. Deep learning, and, and, and so then you go ahead, you feel, okay, you get these variables, you finally come to a, a, a point where you feel like these are the features and the enhanced features that you need and you put it through the model through all of this trial and error of going back and forth and these calculations, you come up with a model and some accuracies, okay? With deep learning, you basically throw the feature engineering out the window. And the back and forth of, let's say the programmer and the domain um, experts, right? So. In classical machine learning, you have a lot of this. They go back, they go forth, they go back. Do we want the deviation? Do we want the average? This is over and over and over again, okay? In deep learning, you put through a minimal amount of data. It could be numeric, um, it could be uh, text, whatever. And rather than you having to do all of this feature engineering, the networks and this, prop, this process of propagation and back propagation, which we'll talk about, um, and you'll see it in more detail as we go forward, it basically, through trial and error of different combinations of weights and um, um, uh, um, error checks, right? says, okay, I'm going to try all these combinations of what I think uh, will make it more accurate to the desired output. And so uh, a practical example is, you know, we feed through, let's say, uh, red, green, blue for an image, right? So an image will have, let's say an image has all these pixels, okay? And each of these pixels has an RGB value, okay? And what happens is, is we will feed through several um, pictures, which are just, again, uh, matrices of RGB values, right? So this one could be, say, 0, 1, 1. This one could be 255, 255, 255, okay? And we'll feed through a whole bunch of these RGB collections. And for them, we'll say this one is a cat, right? for the pictures that look like cats, uh, that have cats. And then for some of them, we'll say, okay, these are pictures of dogs. Okay. We train uh, the system that way. And all we did is supply 
the RGB values. We didn't do any st statistical feature engineering. We didn't calculate deviations. We didn't calculate growth percentages or um, try to detect clusters. None of that. We didn't do any color, you know, great uh, gradients, nothing. Okay. And what deep learning will do is say, okay, I see the patterns for the RGB values for cats and the patterns for the RGB values for dogs. And it will, it will say, okay, um, I'm gonna calculate uh, what I think is a, a, cat, a cat or a dog. And it scores this, right? So it'll say, okay, this is hundred percent. And I'm at say 95%, okay? Cause it knows what the actual images are. So when it goes through its trials, um, and you'll see more of this, but this is at a high level. It'll say, oh, okay, I'm off. Okay, so what do I need to do? I'm going to go ahead and adjust some of the weights between um, the neurons in the network. We'll talk about that uh, so that I get closer and closer. And the analogy is this, okay? Um, rather than this back and forth over here between the programmers and the domain experts, Deep learning does that back and forth within the system over and over and over again until it adjusts the weights between the nodes in the network. And you have to think, think of a network as um, you know, some inputs. And let's say this is an output that predicts either cat or dog. And it's going to take in, let's say there's 255. Uh, nodes on the inside. So this is quickly going to explode, right? And you think of web or a network. And so these are the RGB values coming through. And then what it'll do is it'll take those RGB values and just like your mind has synapses that fire under certain conditions and each of us have different thresholds for those synapses, we call those thresholds weights. And what happens is, is each of these will have a weight, right? And uh, the initial weights we pick randomly and we'll come up and we'll say, okay, these are the weights we have. And based on the inputs, we're going to come through and multiply and um, send the signal through. And if the signal is correct and it predicts a cat correctly or a dog, great. But if it's wrong, we can figure out how wrong we were. And then we'll go back and forth and adjust these weights over and over and over again. Very close, but not exactly brute force. Very close, but not exactly brute force. And the reason for that is um, um, we use something called vector gradient descent, which is uh, a finding from numerical algorithms and partial differential equations to choose the direction we'll adjust the weight. Either we go up or down. Brute force would be, let's just try every combination. Problem with that is it may take a year to figure it out, right? Uh, yes, very similar uh, to regression. In fact, uh, modern day regression uses vector gradient descent to find the least, uh, the line of um, uh, best fit. Right. And we have an example of that we can show you. So um, that is what happens. Now, the reason why we care about this is number one, it eliminates feature engineering. Right. We, instead of that back and forth between the programmers and the domain experts, the back and forth is happening within the systems over and over and over again. And we have these things called GPUs now, which are superior for multi-processing. They have the ability to go, uh, you know, run multiple, multiple tasks, thousands, millions of threads going back and forth, um, but they're not as fast as CPUs. But here it's not a question of how fast you can be. It's a question of how quickly can you update the millions of nodes uh, in this neural network? So the advancements of GPUs and the ability to not have to do that feature engineering has led to a lot of the field uh, and applications using deep learning. Full self-driving uses deep learning. The windshield wipers on Tesla cars now use deep learning. Um, NLP has moved to deep learning. And the idea is 
the features that we would have put together to solve these problems using classical machine learning, right? Using classical machine learning are just taking too long to figure out. And so rather than us spending weeks, months, years figuring out what those features are, we'll let a deep learning uh, network go back and forth for days, maybe weeks, maybe months to ascertain effectively what the, those features were. And if you think about it, that's what's happening, right? At the end of the day, we're taking inputs and we're mapping them to outputs. The question is, what is the mapping function? Right, is it linear, is it some type of polynomial, is it sinusoidal, what is it? And, and what is it for each of those variable combinations? So deep learning aims to get at that by minimizing a cost function um, and going back and forth like we do with the programmers and the domain experts. So at a very high level, that's what's going on. It's exciting because it's it allows things to have it allows us to have made models and find things that we would not have been able to do um, through classical machine learning. I'll give you two more examples of this. Um, if I say 20, 40, 50, what do you say? Um, work in groups of three, and I really recommend finding a group early um, and as I emphasize, it's your responsibility to find, you know, a good group. Right? Um, I think someone's um, unmuted or yeah. Let's try this again. So if I say 20, you can put it in the chat. If I say 20, 40, 50, what comes next? Perhaps I'm muted. Yeah. Uh, 20, 40. Oh, wait, I'm saying it wrong. 20, 30. 40. <laughs> I'm so sorry. 20, 30, 40. What comes next? Thank you. So um, yes, so 20, 30, 40 would give 50. Now the reason you know that, and, and believe it or not, this question is a daunting question for classical machine learning. Certainly through regression techniques, we could arrive at that. But even now through regression techniques, you have to choose the underlying equation. You've got to think about what the polynomial order will be, or what you know is it um, is it a situation where it's sigmoidal, right? And so you have to again get involved. But uh, you know, is there a way for the machines to figure that out without us guiding them, right? And the latest advancements are um, something called LSTM networks, long short-term memory uh, networks, and what they do is just like you were able to ascertain that 20, 30, 40 led to 50, that happened because of the short-term memory. If I had just said 40, you would say, what is he talking about? But because I give you 20, 30, and 40, that memory, that chain is built, yeah? And that chain allows you to come up with the next sequence number. And that's very much what needs to happen rather than me telling you that every time you see 10 you i want you to think of red it's that doesn't give you context what you really want is the pattern to to be built into the machines right i don't want you to say 20 and then every time you, I, you saw 20 it was 21 because i told you that i'd rather you be able to say oh i see that there's a plus 10 diff, uh, uh, sequence here and that is where the field is looking now because the machines are able to make predictions on patterns as opposed to pure mappings, right? So these are some of the differences, right? These are some of the differences and we'll get into some more of this as we go on. Okay, yeah. Um, all right, so unsupervised versus uh, supervised learning. Um, Lately, everything has been talks about supervised learning. We still use unsupervised learning in, in sectors. And I think that certainly as the machines get more context, um, things will edge towards uh, unsupervised models and, and learning. So supervised learning is what we've been talking about. We label some data, the machines see what we've labeled, 
which is very much like how we, we, we train children. You know, they do something, we say good, okay? So the neurons in their brain rewire to say, oh, this is good, okay? And they do something and we say it's bad. And so the neurons in their brain rewire themselves and the weights change and they say, oh, okay, this is bad. Let me not do that again. But that is all happening by us giving them these labels and then their brains uh, molding and adjusting to say, okay, this is good and this is bad, okay? So we're supervising. It's the same thing with uh, machine learning, with decision trees. To begin with, in that notebook we looked at yesterday, we had to feed the model, hey, these are examples of wins, and these are examples of losses. And it sees that, and then it will discern the pattern. And then when we feed it more data, it will new data, it'll say, oh, this is a win, this is a loss. Okay, But it started with us giving them examples. Right? And that's very much how we learn. So for, you know, as you're learning a programming language, nobody knows all the syntax. Right? They, and, and, and some people might, but I certainly don't. And most people, I think, don't. And when we look at, when we look at the documentation, uh, it's nice to understand what all the combinations are that you could feed into this method. But most of us look directly at the examples, right? There are times when we have to be more rigorous and we look at all possible combinations coming through, but the majority of learning happens from, oh, that's how you used it, right? So again, this, this learning by example, right? And it's almost trial and error is what supervised learning is about. Um, and you have to get off the ground somewhere, right? It's like that, that bootstrap step. So yeah, here's some training data, learn the patterns, make your best get at what the patterns are. We'll feed you test data uh, to figure it out if you understood it. And if you stray off course, we uh, will correct you and retrain, okay? So neural networks, decision trees, these are examples of supervised learning models. You can use unsupervised um, neural networks for autoencoding um, and several other features, but uh, several other uh, algorithms, but for the most part, these, um, these modeling types, the algorithms of decision trees and neural networks are used for supervised learning. Unsupervised learning uh, is where we just let the machines run. They go for it, right? We don't tell them what's good or bad. We don't tell them what's high or low. They look at a data set uh, and they come back with statistical uh, inferences. They come back with uh, my favorite unsupervised uh, Learning algorithm uh, comes back with association rules, right? You'd argue it's semi-supervised, but for the most part, it goes out on its own. Um, and there are also, um, you know, algorithms that work on uh, clustering, right? So clustering can be unsupervised and anomaly detection. And I'll say that the there is this move to get more and more of the algorithms that are supervised to be unsupervised. Anomaly detection can be completely unsupervised. And the way we do that is we use calculus. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more depth, but um, there are ways to set the thresholds for where you draw the line. Central question of data science, probably the central question of humanity, or the universe is where you draw the line or lines, right? And so um, well, how do you do that? And in mathematical systems, mathematical modeling, um, the way we draw the line is we, we draw the line, hopefully at optimal points or planes. And those optimal points and planes are completely described by partial differential equations and uh, vector gradients. And so you can use that same uh, um, math, those same mathematical tools to decide sensitivity levels, decide what is anomalous um, uh, in anomaly detection. Same thing with clusters. You can use those same uh, mathematical tools to say, oh, this, this is an optimal point for where the amount of clusters, let's say. Right? And I'll, I'll take you through an example of that on the, the next slide. So. Um, I can tell you like unsupervised learning is a lot of fun. Um, I've worked on uh, two algorithms 
um, that are completely unsupervised that we had to roll from scratch. And you'd be surprised, at least I was very surprised as to how much you can pull off in an unsupervised manner uh, using calculus. And we can thank Leibniz and Newton for, for pushing this because if there weren't so many variables to consider and there wasn't so much data to consider, uh, we could probably figure it all out with calculus, right? You want the optimal points. Too much, it's it's like, you think about a, you know, uh, a drug strength, too little, it's ineffective. Too much, you kill the patient, right? So where do you draw the line? And the answer there is you have to look for the optimal point, right? Where is it most effective, um, but also does not end up causing risk to the patient? So that point tends to be a, a, a local minima or maxima. Yeah? And so we can use calculus to help with these things. Um, or, and the, you can also use things like uh, linear and nonlinear programming. When you have constraints on the situation, there's a situation, you know, now you're in a, uh, a situation where you don't need, again, labeling from the humans. There's only so many options and you can solve for the optimums, right? Okay. <clears throat> So a visualization of a, uh, a neural network. Okay. And um, what we have here is a laundry basket with some clothes in it. And um, let's make this a little larger for you. Yeah, we have a laundry basket with some clothes in it. And um, there's some kind of animal in here. And what we're going to do is we took a picture of it. And we're feeding that into this neural network, right, which has its initial layer um, in the same dimensions of this picture. So a matrix, um, we've simplified it by not putting out all the pixels, um, but these will be RGB values. And what happens is, is we feed it in and just like the light, the, the photons coming into your eye and making their way, imagine this is your eye, making their way from your eye into uh, your mind and then into the subsections of your mind for you to have cognition that it's ultimately uh, you know, a dog versus a cat. And that's what happens, right? These, these signals come through and the electrons in your mind start moving all around. And because of the um, uh, background you have and the nurturing you have, your synapses and the thresholds uh, in your mind are, are based a certain way and certain signals will fire and you'll ultimately be able to say, hey, this is this or this, or I don't know what it is, right? And that is the approach at a high level behind neural networks, right? We try to isolate um, signal from noise by sending through multiple uh, layers and then adjusting the firing weights uh, between those neurons, uh, between layers, so that you can act, figure out what this in fact is. Okay. And uh, you've, you may have heard of you know, deep learning and all deep learning is, is that there are multiple layers involved. Right? And the reason that's important is, is with a single layer, you're talking about a mapping now, okay? But it's hard to um, decipher what the mapping rules are if you only have a single layer to do it. It becomes much easier as you introduce more layers to show that things are linear or sinusoidal or different phenomena. Um, also, the advancements of GPUs allow these lines that you see to be computed, and this is a simple example, right? I mean, in practice, you'll see neural networks with thousands of nodes and hundreds of layers. So the computations to go back and forth, back and forth are very expensive, but it becomes manageable because of the use of GPUs. And the reason for that is, um, uh, are there any video game fans in the audience? I, I, I wish I could play more. I have kids, so I end up playing with them. But um, video games um, are, are really like simulations. 
Right? And um, these simulations have to model the real world. And the, the real world is, is never just a couple of variables. There's so many things going on. Even as we sit here, the atmospheric pressure and uh, you know, the, the, the temperatures, the humidities and the dust particles, there's so many phenomena that are all contributing to what we're doing. And so you have to be able to present that well. And the way to do that is to be massively, massively multi-parallel, multi right? And so that's how these video games are built. We, we built these graphics processor units to take in uh, um, instructions and execute them massively parallel. It was not really about how fast you can go in one direction. It was, you know, how many things can we do at once, right? And, and that was a major breakthrough in simulation. No way you get the windows and the, the, the 3D environments that we have that are so smooth and crisp without being massively multi-parallel. And so that same technology is used to process through these networks. Because if you look, these are just matrices and, and massively multi-parallel games are nothing more than matrix multiplication of frames, right, of, of, uh, of uh, image frames. You know, the image has to turn to this. Well, we have the pixels. And so now what we need to do is interpolate the image to be, you know, this as you turn left, right? There's gonna be a mathematical operation to turn all the pixels a certain way or turn the image a certain way. So that's what's happening. And in order to do this, you need to be in parallel. So one of the reasons why deep learning has become more feasible is because of this massively multi-parallel um, capability from GPUs. So we can thank the oh, video game industry. Yeah, yeah, we can thank the uh, video game industry. Oh, it's dark. Oh, I think you're, yeah. yes, I'm you. <laughs> But the video is strong, what, what is going on? Oh, can you hear me? Sorry. Anything I need to do, choose. You can't see me at all. Oh, can you guys see me? Can you hear me? I can, I can hear, hear you. you and we okay HP camera mirror John, my video display. Yeah. John, I think you're unmuted. Yeah. Um, and um William, can I'm you hear looking me? Looking at the video yes. setting. It doesn't yes, you still can't see me, but I can see you. Yes, Prem. I I can hear you, Prem. Uh, but I think John John is uh, oh, okay. it's not synced. Let me see if I can mute him. Uh, let's okay, see. let me see what is going on. Yeah, you should go ahead and share that. Let me see what is going on. John, I'm going to mute you. There's something. I'm going to try to mute him at least. Um, William, if you can, someone contact yes. him. No, he's unmuted, John. Uh, let's see if I can I can move John. Let, let's see. This this morning I was trying to put the data together and get it ready for analysis. Let's give them a second. Actually, while this is going on, where are we in time? Why don't we take a break and let's come back at uh, twelve fifteen? How does that sound? And we'll let John sort this out. Yes. Good. So, William, can you hear me too? Yes, Prem, I can hear you. Okay. All yes, right, so everybody, you. let's let John sort out what's happening, and we will come back at 12.15, okay? Go grab some lunch. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I'll see you in a minute. Okay, yeah, go, go to the SPS. Uh, let's see. I think that there should be a command for for it, I, have, I haven't done it in a while, but there is a this thing there. But I'm not sure why this thing is not. Are you having a hard time? Okay, you go ahead, I'll ask you, I'm just checking. What is the issue with my, yeah. And stay See, it doesn't allow me to meet John, so. We may have to call him offline. Let, let me see if I can get him offline. Yeah, if you could call him and then we'll we'll just break from here. I'll see everybody at 1215. Go grab some um, food. I think I just muted him. He's muted. Uh, 
Oh, he's muted. Okay. okay. He's muted. Well, let's go grab some food anyhow. So we'll we'll come back in 12:15 and then we'll we'll keep going. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. A brief example of deep learning. All right, decision trees. Okay. So actually before we go forward, let me let me adjust this just a second. Um give me a second. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute. I'm gonna make a change to the slide because we're gonna try something a little bit different. <clears throat> just a second. Duplicate it. That enlarge this. <clears throat> Just a second. Let's move this up. Okay, <clears throat> let me share my screen again. All right, <clears throat> so uh, what we'll do now is take a look at decision trees and decision trees are a type of classical machine learning. Uh, it's not deep learning. And while deep learning, as we talked about, reduces feature engineering, reduces the amount of time that you have to go back and forth with domain experts, um, uses trial and error to arrive at solutions very quickly. Uh, one of the downsides is it's not as easily explainable. I won't say it's not explainable because it does follow deterministic processes, but it's not as easily explainable. And it also will give you an answer, but it won't tell you like why. And one of the things that uh, decision trees do and association rules as well, uh, is it will tell you whether or not um, it's a win or a loss, or in our case, we're going to talk about a restaurant example um, where uh, um, a waiter or a waitress will get a big tip. So is the tip large or not? Uh, uh, a deep learning neural network would tell you whether or not you're going to get a big tip or not, but it wouldn't tell you what the key parameters were or the key features, variables were. Okay, so decision trees, even though we have to do some feature engineering, will tell you what the deciding factors, variables, and the values of those variables were for you to get a big tip. And that is important because uh, you can then say, oh, you know, I, I want big tips to come about. Um, and so these are the variables that I have to adjust to certain values. Okay. So, um, all right, so let's take a look at that. This is uh, a, um, uh, a, a grid of some data that's been collected at a restaurant. And uh, what we have is <clears throat> 10 rows, x one, two, two, four, six, eight, ten 10 rows here. And um, we have a couple of features and we have the outcome, um, so the you know the function value of big tip. And the idea here is one means that there's a big tip, and zero means that you did not get a big tip. Okay, and uh, the variables or features that we're talking about is um, how good is the food? Okay, so the food can be uh, let's say great, mediocre, or yucky. Okay. Um, and how fast was the service? So was the service fast, yes or no? Okay, and that's important, right? Like you go to order food and even if the food's fantastic, uh, and we can make it fantastic, but it might take an hour. So, you know, are you gonna tip well if you had to sit there for an hour? Everybody wants everything. We want great food and we also want it fast, reasonably fast, Yeah. You know? So time is a factor. Uh, and then, uh, of course, price is a factor. Now, you know, did we have to pay um, adequate? Was it high or was it low? So, <clears throat> you 
you know, these are some variables that the restaurant owner has control over. We can adjust how expensive things are. Certainly, if we make things more expensive, we can improve the quality of the food. Um, but there are limits to how fast we can cook. But uh, maybe if we have better ingredients or we have better um, uh, tools, we might be able to cook faster. Um, but then I have to increase the price, right? So you can see this is a multivariable problem. Uh, and we're trying to find what is the sweet spot, right? What is the sweet spot? And we're not thinking about revenue. We're not thinking about profit. We're just thinking about the waiter and waitresses right now, right? So just with these 10 values, with three input, uh, uh, 10 rows with three input variables, and these as the outputs, um, can we figure it out, right? And the, the question is, can we, now as a human, and if this was a rules-based system, I would sit here and try to go through the combinations to ascertain what the patterns are, okay? And, and we'll, we'll actually do that. But what I'm, gonna, what I'm telling you is, is that a decision tree will automatically figure out what the key features are and the key values for those features and then predict whether or not you're gonna get a big tip. So all that analysis and all that programming that the humans would have to do, the decision tree will do. And as this data changes, which it invariably will, okay, instead of having to pay the programmer to go back in and now adjust the big tip system, the decision tree will just look at the new data and update the rules. And then you can look at that and say, oh, I need to you know, improve the food quality or, you know, hey, the only way this is gonna happen is if we charge a little more money, all right? So very important, restaurant business is very tricky, all right? So, um, okay, so can we as humans try to figure this out, all right? And um, the, and any ideas on how you would start this? Anybody have an idea of how, how they would attack this problem? So I'll give you some ideas, right? Um, one approach, and there are several, but uh, who said that? LaMarcus. I noticed that every GYA gets a big tip. Great, great point, right? So what he found is that if the food is great and the service is quick and the price is adequate, there's a big tip. That's right. So let's think of that. GYA, one. GYA. One, okay, and GYA one. So that's correct. Right? But there are other situations where a big tip came about, right? So let's see, can we find them? So what I would do is I would start with, you know, oh, G, if, if the F equals G. So if the food is good and the price is adequate, then you get big tip. Okay, Francis, okay, so let's look at that. So if food is good, right, or if food is G, so he's saying GA always leads to it. GA1, uh, GA1, 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 yes. But we also had, uh, okay, and then William is saying G, X, what does X mean, William? Equals, So yeah, William, what do you mean by the X? It's greater than or equal to one. X, oh, so whatever X is, right? Is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so G and A implies one, right? But G and H can be one, right. So, <clears throat> so you can see there's all these combinations that we have to go through, okay? So um, let me, wa I'll walk through the first column, but I'm glad that everybody's trying to parse this because this is what happens, right? So um, <clears throat> so let's try the first column. So if it's good food, if, if food is G, we have one, but G here is zero. Okay, so now we know straight away, we know that food cannot be the predictor perfectly, right? And normally <clears throat> a human may say, okay, I'm not even gonna look at <clears throat> this single variable anymore. 
But what happens is if you keep going and you score what we call the entropy or the uncertainty of the variable, you can start to narrow things down. And remember in the beginning yesterday, when I was talking about um, you know, how to see the world, in the beginning, it may look like this, right? It may look like this, like there's, it's, it's unascertainable what's happening. But if you look closely, you'll start to see patterns, right? Run it to ground. And so <clears throat> let's try the same thing here now, right? Indeed, I'm telling you, most of data science is about organizing things. And you can argue that most of life is about organizing things, right? And there are limits. You don't want to be too organized because that call, you may run out of time, right? But there are these optimal organizational points of getting things done, okay? All right, so, <clears throat> so we have G is one, G is zero. So, okay, so one and one. So one for two, you can say G is. All right, then again, G is one. All right, so two for three. G is one, three for four, okay? Uh, and I'm just looking at G, okay? So G is one again. So now we're four for five, all right? G is one again, uh, five for six. <clears throat> and G is one again, six for seven, all right? So let me put that in the chat, right? So G is six out of seven implies equals one, all right? So let's just make sure I have that right. So one for one, one for two, uh, two for three, three for four, four for five, five for six, six for seven, All right? So we know that G is six out of seven in terms of one, All right? Okay. And what about M? What can we say about M? <clears throat> So, I mean, this is like, you think about it, like, is the restaurant good? Do we get big tips? If you're a waiter or waitress, you want to go to the restaurant that has the best tips. So, you know, someone would say, well, it's all about the food. Well, is it really? Let's see. So uh, if the food is mediocre, it's a zero, okay? And if the food is a mediocre, it's a zero. So straight away, mediocre is two for two, right? So M is two for two and is equal to zero. Right? So we are organizing it, right? We're taking this, what looks messy and filing it away to find the best rules we can, All right? So straight, just on food, you can say six out of seven times, uh, if the food is good from this data set, <clears throat> the tip was uh, big, okay? But if the food is bad, right? If the food is mediocre, it does not matter about the other stuff. Yeah, if the food is mediocre, it's not going to be a good tip. Or unfortunately, that's not in the control of the waiter or waitress, right? So, okay, so that's one thing. Now, what if we looked at uh, the speed? So y is equal to one, okay? And um, I'll look at just y, right? Is, is that a perfect predictor? What happens? So y is one, y is one, okay? Y is zero, so two out of three so far. And so y is zero. Now, two out of four, Okay, y is one, so that's now uh, three out of five. Okay, y is one now, that's uh, four out of six. Yeah, and y is zero, so that's now four out of seven. And y is one now, so that's now five out of eight, right? Five out of eight. So let's put that down, right? So y, uh, so s of y is equal to five out of eight equaling one, right? Let me check it again. So one, one for one, two for two, uh, two for three, uh, two for four, uh, three for five, um, four for six, and then uh, five for eight, right? And then six for nine. Is that right? Six for nine? Is that what I had here? One, two, let me check this again. This is the jerky to count. One, two, got it right. Got it right. That's three, four, five rights. One, two, three, four, five rights. And how many times was Y wrong? Y was wrong. One, two, 
three times. So it's five for eight. Yeah. Okay. Five for eight. All right. So, <clears throat> so five out of eight times that the service was quick, you got a big tip, but it's not perfect. All right. We can see that. And you can see that some variables are better than others, like the food being great uh, was six for seven. Speed as a function of this uh, being fast, right? I didn't want to say just why here, but so uh, the, the service being quick is not a perfect predictor either, but it's, it's, and it's not as good as the food being good, right? Okay, so let's look at what happens if the service is slow. So uh, <clears throat> was it speedy? I think it's what we we're saying here. So. Uh, if it's no, it's a zero, okay? If it's no, it's a one, all right? So uh, one for two, uh, and that's where it is, okay? So uh, S of N, right? So service is a function. If, if, if yeah, well, it's really big. I should, well, I'll say S of N here, right? So if the service is slow, then we have one for two, right? Um, yeah, we have one, let's leave this as one for two, right? So one time it was, <clears throat> it was not a big tip. And the next time it was a big tip, okay? Now, when something is one for two, uh, you know, we say it's 50-50, right? Another word to say that <clears throat> is it's random, okay? It could go either way, it could go either way. And another way to say that is the entropy or the disorder is unpredictable, okay? And you can score entropy. You can say that disorder is zero uh, in certain situations and disorder is maximized in other situations. And when it's maximized, it means it's 50-50. The entropy of the situation is at, a, is at a max. It's either completely disorganized or it's completely organized, All right? Entropy, entropy measures disorder. That's one way to look at this. There's another way called Gini uncertain or impurity, but they amount to the same. <clears throat> one uses logarithms, one doesn't. Same concept, right? So what we can say is using the speed variable and the whether or not the speed variable had a value of being slow is completely unpredictable of whether or not you're going to get a big tip. So if you're a waiter or a waitress and you're like, oh, I you know, need to rush to get the food out, it's actually not that, right? It could go either way, whether you were fast or not. So, okay. And then let's use the last one. Certainly there's combinations of this, which you've already discerned, but let's see what happens with price, okay? So price, um, we have two values. So um, adequate and high. So if it's adequate, it's one, adequate, it's one. Adequate at zero, adequate at zero. So perfect splits now, right? Two times it was uh, a big tip, one and two times it was not a big tip. Um, again, over here, adequate is one, adequate is zero. So you're again three for three, right? Uh, or three out of six. And then over here, you have one more, which puts you over to say that adequate was one. So you have um, it's consistent. And to begin with, it becomes. It's still consistent here. So A equals one, A equals one. Think of this in terms of consistency order, right? So A is one, A is one, great. A is zero, A is zero, terrible. Now we know that adequate is out of proportion here. It's not as consistent. Um, so we're two for four. Here we are now three for five. And now we are four for six, four for seven, yeah. And here again, we're uncertain. So let me just tally up all the yeses. All right, so this is P of A. And so we have one, two, three, four, right? Four, and out of, we have, um, let's see where the zeros are. One, two, three, so four out of seven. Four out of the seven, it predicted consistently, right? So for big tip equaling one, okay? So you can see, and then of course you can look at the subsets. What happens with G and Y? What happens with F and S? What happens with S and P? What happens with F and P? What happens with F, S and P? Right, we'd have to go through all of these to see it. And the thing is you could do that. And an analyst 
uh, without the use of decision trees would do just that. They would consider all combinations and try to see what that maps to. But the problem with that is right now you're just within three variables and those three variables only have uh, what two variables each, two values each. Yeah. And you're only looking at one outcome and already the combinations are insurmountable, right? Even if you did them, you wouldn't, if you make a mistake, you got to repeat the process, right? It's, it's very, very cumbersome to do this. And so, you know, the pro, and in a rules-based system, we would still try to discover all these things, but look at how difficult it would be to do that. It'd be very difficult. And in fact, this is why, here we are, this is why systems have bugs. All systems have bugs. And the reason there's so many combinations to be considered, and we as humans cannot find all the combinations. Even if you could find all the combinations, how will you code for all of them, right? There's, there's too many combinations. And so, and even here, there's too many combinations, right? Okay, so, so what do we do? It turns out that the same process that we were just walking through, of going through uh, a particular variable with its value and looking at for consistency is, is exactly what, um, uh, oh, is exactly what um, the decision tree does, right? So, um, uh, and let's look at that, right? So let's look and see what this, what happens here. So here is what has been discovered, right? And uh, we could state, yes. So this is, and, and the nice thing about decision trees are they render visually. Right, you can also get a textual uh, output of this and it'll give you like arrows as opposed to this beautiful visual output. And in, in SK Learn, as you saw yesterday, it's even more beautiful. And there's coloring, it's in, in the details, are, it's shocking the amount of reporting you get out of it. Okay, so, so what did it find, right? It found that when the food was bad, as, as we surmised earlier, if the food was yucky, there's no big tip, period. You could have been fast. The price could have been cheap. But if the food is bad, it's over, right? And I think that makes sense. If you order, let's say you order from DoorDash. I'm a big fan of DoorDash. I don't know how that happened. You know, like things are slowing down, but I'm still ordering DoorDash. And uh, if the, the food gets here, now I tip ahead. Of, I mean, everybody tips ahead of time with DoorDash, but I'm a nice tipper, right? So, um, but in the reviews, I, I will just like usually not say anything unless the food is really bad, but you can imagine that people would if the food is poor, right? So even if the dasher got here in time and it was cheap, there was a sale. If the food is bad, there's going to be a poor review. Similar situation here. If the food is bad, there's going to be a, a small tip. Now, um, even if it's, oh, so there's two things, right? So there's mediocre and yucky is what they are saying here. So the food is yucky, right? So it's terrible. There's no tip. If the food is mediocre, this is the M variable, right? So there's three values for food. So M, G, and Y, right? So if the food was mediocre, uh, it's also not going to be a good tip. So the food has got to be great in this example, right? So, okay, great. So if the food is great, then what happens, right? And I'll explain this ordering to you in a second, right? So notice that they chose food first. Notice that they choose food, food first, okay? So then what happens is we look to see what the speed is, right? And if the food was great, that doesn't tell the whole story because it turns out that if the food is great and it was very speedy, you got it here on time, great. That means there's gonna be a big tip and that's reasonable, right? And if the food is great and it, it was not speedy, it's say you took a long time to get it here, well, that doesn't tell the story either, right? Now we've got to see, well, was it expensive? Because it turns out in this example, if the food was great and it took a while to get here, as long as it was not that expensive, I'll still tip high. But if it was expensive and it took a while to get here, even though it was great, I'm not going to tip high, right? Now, look at this. This is a simple example, a simple example, right? 
But the amount of combinations that we would have had to have gone through to arrive at this and the insight as to what's happening in this business is insurmountable for humans. Imagine what happens if you have hundreds of, of uh, rows with many, many, many values and many, many variables and many, many outcomes. The reality is, is a business has to be run not only to see if the, um, uh, if the waitresses and waiters are going to get big tips, but if the business is profitable and are the customers happy. There's so many output variables. So to consider all of that and get optimal values and understand what's happening is daunting. It's a daunting problem. But now we have algorithms that can figure this out for us. And this is so important because it, in, it's, it's not so much about the initial finding. It's the fact that they can do it over and over and over again, right? And, and the consequences of these machines being able to learn, the machines being able to learn without us having to program them, right? Is, is life-changing. One of the reasons why I believe personally that they're going to rival, and I actually think they will beat our capabilities, right? There is context and, and understanding that we have that they don't have yet, right? But you know, we've been around for a long time and we've been socializing with each other for a long time. And the internet has changed things. The machines are talking to each other and, and quantum when it arrives is gonna solve a whole lot of storage and multi-threading problems. And so I'm very, very optimistic uh, that they will match, if not beat, uh, our capabilities because they're learning now. I mean, this, this is, I don't know. I mean, like, I, this is just me. I think decision trees are unbelievable that they can come up with this kind of intelligence. And is that not the intelligence of the situation? This is what's happening, right? So, okay. And that's one example, right? That's one example of how this works. And it's exactly how we did it. Now, let me talk about the ordering of this decision tree. Why did it choose food? Why did it then choose speed? And why did it then choose price? Right? It could have, it could have chose any of these variables, right? But why did it take food first? And the reason is, if you look back at these columns, right? What you'll find, remember when we were scoring it, I said that if it was good, it was six out of seven, right? And if it was mediocre, it was perfect, okay? And if it was yucky, it was perfect. One time it was yucky, it was zero. So there's almost, there's no inconsistency, all right? There's no disorder, uncertainty, if the food is yucky or mediocre. It's clear. Food is yucky, food is mediocre, no tip, period, right? So that means that it's an excellent indicator for what's going to happen. Another way to say it is the amount of information that we gain from choosing food as the primary variable is higher than the information we would have gained from choosing speed or price. Why? Speed is not as deterministic. It's more uncertain, right? If you looked at, like, and let's look at price because price was the least deterministic, right? So again, price we saw was four out of seven, right? So consistent, consistent, inconsistent, inconsistent, consistent, cons inconsistent, consistent, right? So we, we see that price has issues with adequate. What about when price was high? It's okay, zero, now it's inconsistent. H is one, H is zero, we don't know. H is one, okay, so one out of three or two out of three, right? So again, we have inconsistencies. And so what it does is it, splits on the variable that has the highest consistency, and then it charts a path through using that variable, the values within that variable, right? It's kind of like creating a map through the data, right? So it started here because it said, hey, uh, oh, can I, oh, wrong, uh, just a second, let me go back. So it started here because it said, this is the best indicator, right? This is the best one. So let's say best, right? And then what it did is 
it said, all right, so there's uncertainty across all these columns. None of them are perfect predictors, but let me start with the one that has the best chances. And it said, well, what happens when it's M? Well, when it was M, we knew it was this. So I can, I can give you a decision on that. And when it was, you know, so I, I know this. And when it was yucky, I can give you a decision on that. So the tree gets its first leaves. Yeah, straight away. And you want the, the variable that gives you the most leaves because the leaves are the decisions. I want to know what's happening. Okay. So then what happens is it says, well, okay, so there's uncertainty what happens when the food is great. So let's trace that. All right. What happens when the food is great? Well, when the food was great, as you guys surmised earlier, when it was great, and the speed was y, uh, speed was uh, uh, speedy, right? Um, so it was speedy or it wasn't speedy, right? So when we have g and y, it's perfect. So these two, perfect, right? These two, perfect. These two, perfect. Okay. So the question came about, so it can chart that. It can say, hey, I can give you leaves for g and y, g and y, g and y. All right, great. So now the problem is what happens when we go to g and n? So now it's going to consider that path. Well, let's talk about G and N now. This is the first real uncertainty we've seen, right? G and N has problems for us, okay? So the rest of it we've taken care of, right? We're cutting through this data set. So what happens when it's G and N? Well, it looks at G and N and it says, well, the one time we saw it, it was G and N. Well, if the price was high, right, what happened? So G and N, it was low. G N H gives low, right? So food is great, it's not speedy, and the price was high, was a zero. Did we see another example of that? No. So we only have one other G and N, right? So when this happened, it was zero. So straight shot, that's another leaf. We can say that um, when it's, the food is speedy, uh, sorry, when the food is great and that the, the food is not speedy and the price is high, we know that it's gonna be a small tip. It's not a big tip, okay? And then the other situation, we had a G and N as well, right? But here the food was, the price was adequate. And is there another example of that? No. So this is perfectly consistent now, right? When it's A, it's one, which means you get a big tip, all right? And what's happened is you've now gone through and considered all combinations because you've walked these variables, right? You went through the, the first column and you then said, okay, let's consider the second column, all right? And you chose the second column because the second column was the next most consistent, next best, right? If it was price, you would have gone to the third column, but because the speed column gave you more consistency, right? You wouldn't go to a variable that said, I don't know what's gonna happen, right? A perfectly random outcome for the variable, why would you even look at it, right? So you go for the variable that gives you not perfect consistency, but the best consistency you can have, all right? And so that's why we went to speed. That is why speed is number two in this decision tree in, in its height. And that is why food is number one. And finally, price is number two, okay? So that is at a high level how this algorithm works. And it is, every time, every, every time I look at decision trees, I get, uh, sorry, this is three, I apologize, right? So that's one, two, and three. Every time I look at decision three, decision trees, I get a little stunned because we went from something that was in initially totally disorganized. We don't know precisely what these patterns are. You saw, we tried to cut it up and we had to think about it. Small data set. And look how it just, perfectly organizes the uncertainty that we initially had, right? I mean, it is, it is astonishing, astonishing to me. So, um, and how you took something that even though it wasn't perfect, even though food was not a perfect predictor by itself, but if you kept digging, right? you kept digging, you faced some uncertainty in the consistency of what food was saying, but if you kept digging and stuck with it, you found that if you trailed it just a little bit further, you ended up with something that was decisive, right? That did give a clear answer. And so uh, for humans, that's a lesson in perseverance, but for them, we can only go so far, right? 
and this is again a small data set, but it's it's amazing how you can ascertain something with perfect order from variables that are inconsistent, right? And um, yeah, I mean, and on and, and just about any data set that I have worked on, I try to put decision trees on them almost immediately. And uh, I almost always find something and the customer or, or us internally, if we're doing analysis, um, sure. Uh, so the customers and, uh, the, and or us for analysis are almost always shocked by the findings. What do you mean? Right. I mean, I remember being in a meeting uh, when we were working on the Arcos data set and I, I said, look, this is what it's found. And they were like, that must be on a simulation. That's not on real data. I said, no, that's the real data. And it's, it, should, it should be it, it almost, it shouldn't be a surprise that these rules come out and are surprising because there's too much data. We're not even talking about big data, all right? We're just talking about a couple of rows and columns, right? A couple of rows and columns lead to decision trees that are <laughs> insurmountable to reproduce with high accuracy, right? Um, let me say one more thing about this. If you run a decision tree on a data set and you come back with no tree, there's two things, right? So let's, let's, say, you, let's say you run a decision tree on a data set and you come back and there's no tree. Any idea what that might mean? What do you think? I'll wait for this. This is an important, an important question for you guys. What does it mean if you run a decision tree? And let's assume that you've compiled everything correctly. Let's assume that there's no errors in the data set or your processing. You've run a decision tree and no tree has been rendered. No rules have come out. What does that mean? What, what do you think that means? Take a minute to think about this one, yeah. And put your answers in the chat if you would like. There was no way to split 100, zero, split the data. What do you mean, Alexander? Can you elaborate on that? Uh, you know, I remember you saying yesterday that with the decision tree, they they were split it like oh, 100% of people of, of games one scored over 98 and 0% of the games below that were uh, they lost. So like if if they, I was just wondering if like they can't do that 100% like decision, does that mean they can't make the tree? Okay, so I, th I think I see what you're saying. So yesterday we were looking at the basketball, thank you by the way, Alexander. So yesterday we were looking at the basketball set and we were talking about what happens when you score a certain amount of points, right? And uh, I had mentioned a human may look at it and say that if you scored less than a hundred points, I think you're on the right track, by the way, Alexander. If you scored less than a hundred points, um, you lose, right? And if you score, you have to score more than a hundred points. And you'll hear that. For those of you who follow basketball, you'll hear uh, analysts saying, uh, you know, they need to score more than 100 points, or they need to score more than 120 points, or they need to hold the opponent to less than 100 points, right? Uh, and we looked at that, and we found that it wasn't 100 points. It was, I think, actually 98 uh, points, so 99 or higher, right? If you scored less than 98, less than or equal to 98, you lost, right? So um, the question that I think what you're saying Alexander is is had we chosen a hundred right as the split of, of the decision then we would not be able to say for sure what was happening because there were some times when you were over uh, sorry you were under a hundred and you won right and even though most of the time you were under a hundred you lost there were instances where you were at 99 points and you uh you won right is that what you're getting at 
Yeah, I think so. Or like, um, like if if they if they look at points and they look at rebounds and then they look at you know assists and then they say like, well, none of these are predictive of win or loss. Like, you could you could score zero points and still win. You know, like it theoretically. Like, if you're seeing like people score zero points and still win a game, and people score a hundred points and still win a game. But so they can't, so they can't split the, the sample or they right. can't split the data. Yes, I'm with you now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So keep going, Alexander. I didn't want to stop you. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so I guess then they wouldn't be able to make a decision tree if the data or if the variables that they have aren't able to split the, the data into any meaningful pattern. Perfect. And so this is a perfect example, excellent answer. And so what is being said is that the data that has been sent in is uh, inconsistent, right? Uh, and it leads to the situation being unpredictable. Now, what that means though, is one of two things. Either we don't have enough data for the organization Okay, think about lending practices. I always like to think about lending practices, right? So you, you, you decide that you're going to audit how loans were given to consumers. Home loans, let's say, okay? And you, know, you look at their income brackets, you look at demographics, and you put this into a decision tree and the decision tree comes back out with no tree, right? And so then you say to yourself, well, maybe we didn't have all the data we need. So maybe we go get some more data, all right? And let's say that we get all the data that the analysts claim, or the loan officers claim to use to make a home loan, okay? Credit scores, demographics, uh, uh, past history, criminal histories, whatever, okay? We get it all. And if you still find that after you put it through in the decision tree, that there's no decision tree drawn, that means that the decision is really unpredictable, which means the way that they're handing out loans is non-deterministic, right? It means it really depends on the person, the temperature, there's some other variable, right? But that should never be the case, right? with something that important, whether or not you get into a university. Okay, sorry, fellow educators, and, and I, no, no one's gonna like this, but if we really examine the admissions process, right, there better be a decision tree that comes out. There better be a decision tree that comes out because if you have people who had certain statistical scores who did not get in, and let's factor time, let's say they apply at the same time, so you have people with the same scores who did not get in and people with the same scores who did get in, how do you factor that, right? How can that be, right? So decision trees, the absence of decision trees also are a finding. It means that what's happening is not predictable and some things need to be predictable. How you get into schools need to be predictable, right? How you get a home loan needs to be predicted. Can't just be, hey, let's roll the dice and pray. No, you, you know, we all work to have good credit. We all work to have good jobs. We all work to have good savings so that we can get home loans, right? But if it turns out that's not enough, well, then what is it, right? So the absence is also very important. Think about this. We run a decision tree on Brownian in motion. Where's the physics guy, folks? You run a decision tree on Brownian in motion, there's gonna be no tree because it's perfectly random can't say right and that's what it should be but if you run a decision tree on consumer lending there better be a decision tree and if there's not there needs to be an audit what do you mean right why those decisions those processes should be nearly perfect nearly perfect and there should be exceptions so uh chaotic system very good right yes 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 so the absence of them is also important. Let me give you one more example on this history. Very near and dear to my heart. Okay, these things are very, very near and dear to my heart. Um, 
if you create a decision tree, right? And uh, what will happen is, is it, it will learn the rules and you'll have accuracies that then come about, okay? So what happens is, is, you know, here's a situation where we've looked at this data and based on this data, this is what we think um, it is the decision tree, okay? But then what happens is, is we fast forward in time and we start having new transactions come through, new people come to the restaurant. And um, we notice that the decision tree is making bad predictions, right? Let's say our accuracy has fallen to 65%, right? Um, or what's happened is, uh, another example is before we even get there, let, let me let me simplify this a bit. Let, when, we, when we run these algorithms, we break out into train and test sets, okay? And again, what happens with train and test sets is we will say before we go to the real world, we wanna simulate what it's like to look at, to predict on data we've never seen before, okay? Because we know that's gonna happen. So what we could do, and this is an arbitrary uh, split is we could say, we're gonna split right after uh, X5. So these other five, so this is gonna be training. This is gonna be training and this is gonna be test, okay? So what happens is, is when you do this, the decision tree is going to perfectly understand the training set, right? It is gonna absorb the patterns like no other, right? And figure out what's what. And if a tree exists, it will render it, all right? And it's gonna say, you know, the, this is what the situation is, okay? But then what will happen is, is when you feed the test values in, this is stuff that the model's not seen before, it's going to say, I either got it right or wrong. And those are the accuracies we care about. Okay? And that's the accuracy we quote. You, you never quote training accuracy. Nobody cares. We care about what happens when you send it to test. Right? We care about what happened when you had values that you were not able to learn about and the model had to project from what it was taught. Right? So this is like, basketball practice, this is the game, right? You care what happened in the game, right? So let's say, you know, in a, in a, a good situation, fantastic. You know, you were at 95% in test. Great, okay? But what happens if you get something terrible, like 40%? You had a decision tree, it found some rules, okay? If it didn't, if, it, if there wasn't any kind of order, you wouldn't have found any rules, but you found some rules. Let's say that we got this. And of course, training is perfect, right? It's gonna absorb the rules and put out what happened and it has to be 100 on 100. But if you then go into the test situation, which is supposed to stimulate the real world. Yeah, that's right. Very good, Francis. So that's one possibility. We overfit, which means we've learned too much about the training uh, data as opposed to the test data, um, as opposed to what's really happening, right? Um, but anyhow, you went to the real world and you got a very, very poor score, right? In that situation, it could be that we just spent too much time in here, right? It could be that um, we didn't spend too much time, but that it's a chaotic system. Another really good point, uh, Francis. And that by itself, is is a finding like the the thing that I really want to get to you is the downside is still an upside right like everybody wants models that have incredibly high accuracy okay yeah that's great we all want that but what I'm telling you is is the absence of a model like no decision tree is an incredible finding right it basically says that your processes are random okay which is unacceptable right and uh the the a decision tree which has very low accuracy also implies that you know, assuming that we've we've man, we've mitigated for overfitting and I'll talk about how we do that but let's say we mitigate for overfitting that implies that the phenomena is largely uh, chaotic or uncertain which means we need more data and if and if you're in an organization and you're looking at some some phenomena and you create you think you have enough data and you've created a decision tree and you're coming up with poor accuracy. That means there's more to be learned about the situation. There are features that we are missing. And it also means to the business or, or the analysis that you're doing, the stakeholders, is if these are the variables that you're using 
to make decisions. And we have that in the decision tree. If, if FS and P are what you're using, and that's what you know decisions are being made on, and we are using those same variables and we're coming up at 40%, that means that your indicators are at best poor. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. That means we need better indicators. Right? So the even poor accuracy implies that we need to improve the process and variables that we have in place to be smarter about what's going to happen. So poor findings are actually good findings. Right? So don't be discouraged. Okay. You run a model, you come up at 40, 50%, and, and this is how the decisions are being made. We need more data. We need better features, right? We need better variables. Or, or maybe you don't have enough, right? But the, the point is that the conversation continues, right? Don't ever feel like, oh, you know, the model is terrible. I'm doing something wrong. It, it could be. It could also be that the situation is unpredictable. And in many situations, it is, right? How many people have done that much thorough analysis? How many people have got it down to partial differential equations and considered all the combinations? It's rare. We may need more variables. That's also perfectly acceptable. There could be phenomena that we don't know about. So very near and dear to my heart, okay? A forgotten algorithm. Uh, everybody talks about deep learning. It's also very important, but <clears throat> listen, the ability to know what the key factors are, are important. It's important. Like, why did it happen is, is sometimes more important than what happened, right? And here I'm telling you that, you know, why did they get bad tips? Well, it's obvious. It's because the food was yucky or it's mediocre. Food is the most important predictor. We can get into the other combinations, but it comes down, if you had to say, it comes down to the food and then speed and price, right? Those are important things to know, as opposed to, uh, if you just give us these things, we're going to tell you what it's going to be. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. But I need to know what to adjust now, right? So the practical use of decision trees is unmatched. Why we call them decision trees, right? And you'll see how easy they are to create. Phenomenal. It's phenomenal how easy it has become in Python and Jupyter. It is just, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, uh, astonishingly ridiculous. And, you know, I remember when I first learned about them and I had to code these things by hand. And even then I was, you know, amazed, but now it's like a couple of clicks, you know, a, co a couple of statements identifying uh, what the features are and you have to do some work in cross validation. We'll talk about that. Um, and, and then you're kind of there. It's just, uh, I don't know. Any questions on this? Okay, so, all right, let's talk about, um, uh, and let me adjust this one as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing just for a second. Um, so I can adjust this. I, I like doing the before and afters uh, with the class. So let me, let me just, I think this one is actually set properly, but I'm going to um, I'll cut this for now. All right, so then I'm gonna start sharing again. All right, so uh, a variant of sorts on decision trees are association rules. Extremely important. Uh, association rules is how retailers now figure out what Target did about the, you know, if you bought zinc and a, and a bath rug uh, and a larger purse that there was an 87% chance that you're pregnant or you're gonna, you know, I mean, like, how did they figure that out? And think about that. It wasn't, it wasn't bulletproof that you were pregnant. It was, there's an 87% chance. So they've got a, a confidence around it, right? A probability around it. And so decision trees look at 100 on 100. This is it. This is what happened, right? And if you're in a situation where it's got to be bulletproof, it's the decision tree, okay? And you always run that. That's my first run, right? Like what is hard and fast about the situation, okay? And so decision trees give you that. But if you're looking at a situation where there could be, you know, some exceptions and that you want to see what the uh, um, associations are that are not bulletproof, 
then you can look at association rules. And they do the same thing. They look at you know, all the combinations and they tally up uh, which combinations have the highest uh, frequency and probabilities, right? And again, doing that for every value in a data set with many variables and many uh, rows insurmountable to humans. Okay, and association rules are lar largely unsupervised, right? I mean, you would say something like, find me all the association rules with a certain amount of support uh, and support means frequency. So for example, let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, on in Amazon's uh, 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 retail database of sales, there was a, a situation where somebody bought, let's say Amazon starts selling motorcycles. Somebody bought a motorcycle and a My Little Pony doll in the same transaction. Okay, better example, somebody bought a My Little Pony doll and one week later bought a motorcycle, right? And let's say that we have that, okay? That happened one time. Does that mean that we are going to start sending motorcycle advertisements to everybody who bought a My Little Pony doll? Probably not because it costs to do motorcycle advertising, it costs to do anything, right? So what we would do is we'd say, well, hey, if it's only happened in one item out of the billion some odd transactions we've had, then we wouldn't do that. So it depends on how many transactions in total, right? And what, we, what that comes down to is a support level. So we'll say if that happens in let's say 50% of all transactions, okay, of all T, then I'm concerned. I wanna know about that. So you're telling me 50% of the time and all out of 50, uh, out of all the transactions we have, let's say we have um, uh, um, a thousand, okay? If 500 transactions had a My Little Pony leading to a motorcycle being bought next week, well, that's something that we don't think is spurious now, right? So, um, I'm sorry, I lost the chat. Let me look at this. Uh, okay, yeah. So, all right, let me just move this over here. So, that is how. Um, association rules look at the problem, right? You can set supports. Sorry, I'm that screen there. So this 50% is a support level, right? And then you can choose also confidences. All right, you can choose confidences. So you want to see something that happens in at least 50% of all transactions, and you want to see everything that, say, happens with a 95%, this confidence is effectively a probability, right? It's effectively a probability. And so uh, now you figure out what's happening, but not at 100% of the time, right? And that's important. And, and right away, well, let's go through an example, and then we'll talk about how this can be some of the side effects of this, all right? So we have here some buying patterns, right? So, um, you know, beer, orange juice diapers, beer, Q-tip diapers, beer chips, beer Advil. So what are some patterns that you can see in this data set? What would you say? You can post into the chat if you'd like, or you can talk, either way is fine. Take a second to look at it, yeah. Beer is the only pattern. These are like words to live by. Uh, thanks, Azad. Yeah. Maybe. What else? Oh, this is interesting. So, well, biology says beer as 100%, diapers 50%, right? Diapers happens in 50% of the transactions. Okay. Yeah. Chips and Advil. Yeah. Okay. Question mark. It's a good observation. Very interesting. Keep going, let's, uh, let's see if we can get two or three more. 
Advil in the last transaction for the hangover. That's right. Yeah, good. You're on the right track. Yeah. Yeah. Also very, very fascinating algorithm. One of the, one of, again, one of the lost arts. Most people, when you'll talk about this, we'll talk about, and regression is important. There's no doubt about it, but you'll talk about uh, linear regression and we'll talk about deep learning a lot. But these two are the ones that uncover the, why did it happen? What's, what's going on here, right? Yeah. Any other ideas? So this is sort of the canonical example. All right, so let me give you some of them, all right? So uh, beer is all over the place, that is correct, okay? Another one is um, beer, the purchasing of beer implying diapers is at a 50% confidence. What does that mean, okay? And this is important because there's, you have to have some understanding of this and there's a way to phrase this so that we can say if and then in the future, right? But right now what we can say is if you bought beer, there's a 50% chance that you also at that time, at that time, bought diapers, okay? You say we're 50% confident that you bought, yeah, 50% of shoppers are, <laughs> what? Why, because they don't buy diapers? Is that what you're saying, Francis? Huh? What is that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay, so, um, all right. Uh, so 50% of the time that you bought beer, you bought diapers, okay? But it's not the same way the other way around, right? If you bought diapers, right? there is a 100% chance that you bought beer, right? So you, know, you have to think about that, right? It's a subtlety. So much of this is subtlety. And as we get more and more organized, the more these subtleties are manifested, right? How we go from chaos and high entropy to low entropy and organization and, and cause and effects, right? Now, very quickly, um, it's hard to prove causality. I, I know that the audience is very educated. We know that, okay? But there are ways to get closer to it, okay? And obviously, like, we can't say it perfectly because we don't have the systems isolated. You know, I could say that, um, you know, you're gonna buy uh, diapers, uh, let's say, uh, three months later, if you bought this uh, now, but the reality is, is there could be other factors that we don't know about that influenced you to do something, right? So it's hard to prove causality entirely, okay? That being said, okay, we can still get pretty close, reasonably close, right? Well, nobody will have all the variables. So one way to do this is we call it lagging the variable. Okay, right now, these things have happened at the same time. They happened at the same time, okay? But what happens, what happens if you say, this is what happened on day zero, okay? And this is what happened, let's say, this set of uh, uh, transactions is what happened on, I don't know, day 14. What happens if you start modeling the data and feeding it into the association rules algorithm where it's not just the current transactions, but it's also what happened 14 days from now, right? Then you can get into a situation where if it starts saying that, um, let's say that the input was, let's say that the input was what happened today and all that was bought was beer, okay? and that 14 days later, this is what was bought. Now you can say, it's not perfect causality, I know it, but we have associations to show that if this happens now, 14 days later, this is what happens at a certain confidence, right? So if you lag the variables by a certain amount of time, you can get closer to causality. 
right? Impossible to be proved unless you have the system locked. We know that, okay? But you can get closer, you can get closer. All right. Um, all right, where are we in time? Okay. Uh, all right, so this is a, a quick problem uh, that uh, I give to uh, aspiring data scientists, okay? So uh, if, you, if you solve it, all right, let's take a second to think about this. Uh, if you solve it, just write in the chat that you have it, okay? But don't write the answers, okay? Uh, and I'll talk about it for a second, but so just to give everybody a shot at it, uh, just write that you have it. And then maybe in five minutes or so, I'll circle back to the class and we'll talk about it, okay? But I'm curious to see who arrives at it first. You may or may not have it right, uh, and we can discuss it. So again, uh, and those of you who have taken IQ tests, you'll notice that sequences are usually always there. Then they don't even have to be a numeric sequence, be you know a text sequence. And you could argue that everything is really sequences, right? What comes next? So what happened before, All right? So, okay. So given the following, let's say you have the inputs three, six, and four. And that results in the output of 18, 108, 648, and 3,888. This is one record, okay? And then you have another record, which has the inputs of two, minus two, and five, which gave you the outputs of minus four, eight, minus 16, 32, and negative 64, right? If that is the case, all right, then what is the output of two, three, and four, all right? And uh, so what is the sequence going to be, all right? Uh, the second question is, is there a formula to get the last term, okay? Um, can you prove that the program works? Usually I have them write a program. You don't have to write a program. And if any of you are computer science experts, uh, you can tell me what the time complexity is. But this is a typical interview problem for a data scientist. You've got to be able to discern some patterns. And I'm not asking you know, someone to have incredible domain experience at something. I'm you know, looking at straight numbers. So it should be uh, calculatable. And you have to be able to program a little bit. And you have to understand, um, you know, you have to be able to do a little bit of math. So can you show what the formula would be for what you found? Uh, and then can you analyze uh, and, and come up with the solution efficiently? And the way we do that is we quote a time complexity and we code it a certain way. So take a crack at it, okay? As soon as you have it, just uh, put in the chat that uh, you think you've solved it, all right? And then we'll discuss it. When I see a certain amount of uh, solutions and or we run close to time. Let's give this five minutes to start, right? Yeah. I'll work it out as well because it's been some time since I've looked at this. Okay, so. If you have questions, let me know, yeah.
It's tricky. Hmm? It's tricky. Close, Dana. Actually, wait, no. Yeah, I think I think I made a mistake. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but don't put the answer in. But thank you for <laughs> okay. Thirty and twenty-four. Yeah. Yeah. Can you find a formula, Dana? Let's see if anybody else can arrive at this as well, yeah. Let's give it uh, another two, three minutes, yeah. Okay. Time complexity. Two, three, and four. Okay, <clears throat> so let me discuss it. So first of all, fantastic data. Data, can you talk about how you arrived at the solution and what do you do? Um, the first number on the right-hand side is the first and second number, the multiplication of the first and second number. Um, and then every subsequent number is times by the middle number. And there's the last number on the left side is how many numbers you want in your right-hand side. Really good. What do you do for a living, Dana? Yeah. I'm a cancer, re cancer researcher. Fantastic, yeah. Do you do a lot of math? Yes. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's exactly right. And let me... Let me see if I can write in uh, green or something here. The screen is dark. So it's going to draw. And let's change this to well, we'll white and green. OK. So uh, outstanding observation. You arrived at it very quickly, too. OK. Um, you know, I've been in interviews with people where this has taken 30 minutes to an hour. Right. So uh, for the sake of time, we won't have to write the program. So we have compilers here with this. But I can show you what it would look like. Um, but let's think about what's happened here, right? So that you've you know, seen the pattern quickly and that's right. So this is the um, starting coefficient, right? This is what I would call the base and this is the exponent, right? And so I typically like to write this as N, but well, I don't know, we could write it as E. And so what's happening, right? Um, the first time through, uh, we can, and we'll start with this one over here, right? So I'll start here so you can see the whole sequence. So 18 came from three times six, OK? 
Okay. And then what happened is you had 108, right? So the observation is that, well, 108 is just six times 18, right? So you're consistently multiplying it by this uh, base number here, right? So then you say, all right, well, I'm going to multiply this by six. Okay, so let me get rid of this comma. So you had three times six, and you multiply it by six again to get 108. And then what happened is you get 648, right? Well, 648 is this six again multiplied by 108. So what's happening, right? You're going to multiply that whole number by six. Right, let me see if I can round this off a little better for you, right? To get 648. And guess what? All right, this 3,888 is just six times 648 again, right? This is, again, great observation from the end that it's the fourth time. So we're going to multiply this whole thing again by six, right? And what do we have? So you have this three, right? Let me do it like this. You have three followed by, um, we'll say E, E sixes here, which equals four, right? And this reduces down to uh, three times six to the fourth, which in general is going to be uh, your coefficient times your base, right? Raised to, the um, e power, right? C times b to the e. And um, you can arrive at this with a for loop, okay? And the time complexity for this would be O of n. It's linear time. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, this is sort of what we do. We look for patterns over and over and over again. And the good news is that we don't have to go through all the patterns that exist in the data set. But you will still find, um, you know, which algorithms do you choose, and how do you interpret these results? What's the right visualization for this, right? Um, you know, do we need to look for more variables? So there are still some things that we have to compute as those things get smaller and smaller. All right, very good. Okay, so I always like doing some math. Okay, all right, uh, all right. Let's keep going. All right, so um, I'll spend a little bit of time talking in big data and then I'll take you to um, a Pyth some Python notebooks so you can see things running and in action, okay? So, you know, what is big data? Is it, is it dangerous, right? Does anybody know why I, I say, is it dangerous? Nobody, yeah. Um, Turns out that this term, this big data term, has become so cliche, so ubiquitous, that there's even a band called big data. Anybody heard of the band big data? There's a band. And they're pretty good. They're pretty good. Like they do, like they're pretty good live. That's right? how I judge a band, right? How, how good are you when you're live? And um, outside of the training set, right? So um, uh, big data has a song called Dangerous. And it actually mocks like all the big data stuff going on and how, how advertising is using similar patterns all the time and it doesn't get you anywhere. So, well, I mean, we're, we're in an audience full of researchers and, and practitioners and educators here. So, that, you know, obviously we're gonna say, what, what is big? What does it mean, right? And so the, you're absolutely right to say, what does that mean? And the, the term itself is, uh, is vague, but there are still um, not entirely vague, just like the decision tree, right? There are still heuristics that we can find from it. And essentially what's happening is anytime that you have a, a data set that you cannot process through traditional means, um, you know, think of it as like, you can't process this data on your laptop, there's not enough memory. Or even if you had enough memory, the amount of combinations it would take for you to pull this off uh, would are insurmountable. Your laptop would melt or it would take three weeks of straight processing. You're now in a situation where you're dealing with big data, okay? And uh, how do we solve that, right? The most common approach is that we scale horizontally. What that means is we start taking this data and we move it into clusters, whether that be on some lab of, that you have access to, whether that be in the cloud, either way. The point is that you, you're not able to improve the situation and get the processing that you want done 
uh, via vertical scaling, I'm going to add a new GPU or I'm going to buy a better laptop. These things are you know, not going to solve the problem. You need to move into a situation where you're doing distributed processing, right? With distributed memory. And so that's the example, right? Like imagine you have a bus and you, you know, the bus holds maybe um, 50 people, right? And, or it's 25 people, but now you have 50 people. So maybe you want to build, if this is one time and then we're getting off the planet, uh, we want to build a bigger bus. So we build a bus that holds 50, no problem. We'll add an upper rack. Okay, but now what happens when, let's say you have to go to 5,000 people, right? Can you build a bus that goes that vertical? Unlikely. So what do we do? We get more buses. Big bus problem, big bus problem. So that's the idea, right? You horizontally scale. Um, and it's the same thing over here, right? So if you can scale up to make the computer faster, fine. But um, it's expensive. You're a single point of failure. You may not be able to scale to the point that you need to. And so what we do is we try to scale out horizontally. And you can argue Instagram, Google, Facebook, these are nothing but big data systems. What's happening is not that complicated, right? PageRank is not that complicated. Uh, um, posting images and calculating likes is not that complicated. You guys have seen very complicated, right? We've seen really, really complicated problems, things that have not been solved. Um, so, you know, uh, posting images and being able to respond quickly on likes and, and uh, comments is not complicated, but what it is, is dealing with big data. You're talking about the world's data, right? Everybody's posting those images. Everybody's doing Google, uh, everybody's doing internet searches, right? Everybody is trying to share data with each other. Um, so how do you manage to deal with all that data? And all of that is being solved with commodity hardware, cheap hardware, scaling horizontally. Google really happened because they took a whole bunch of cheap Linux servers running on old IB, uh, old, um, 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 with, uh, old uh, uh, what is it, uh, 386 uh, uh, desktop machines, right? x86, 386 desktop machines and running, in hor uh, running horizontally because they found that they could pull off computing and memory uh, to consume the world's data, right? Uh, by scaling horizontally on cheap hardware. And improvements in bandwidth help that, right? But that's how they pulled it off. So now why is this important to data science? Sometimes, more often than not, the problem requires an enormous amount of data. Enormous amount of data. A peer of mine, a uh, good friend, brilliant professor, he uh, just published a paper. And the paper, the paper, okay, cost $30,000 of compute time. You think about that, right? You have to get a grant to write the paper that's software, okay? So like the computing expenses involved are increasing and it's because the amount, in order for us to find new things, we're having to consider different variables and a lot of, a lot of data and, and so, we have to learn how to deal with these things. And so that's why horizontal scaling is such an important factor and why we end up going to things like the cloud because they can horizontally scale very quickly and you don't have to build your own data center, et cetera. Okay, so um, we can be a little bit more specific about big data, um, the volume of it. And think about this in terms of as, as, math, as mathematical as we can, what are you gonna do as the, volume of data approaches infinity. How are you gonna deal with it? And you know, what do you, how are you gonna deal with fast responses as the request for your data approach infinity? Very, you know, it's one thing to say, like I'm gonna take a terabyte worth of data and I'm gonna analyze it and I'll get back to you in a month, okay? I can get some storage and go to Best Buy, uh, Amazon, and I can order a, 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 you know, a, a big drive, let's say a hundred terabytes. I can, eat, I can go and go get a bunch of drives and uh, string them together in a RAID configuration so that I, it appears as a large drive and I can analyze this data. And I'll say, I'll get back to you in a month. No problem. What happens when you have to be able to do that in a couple of seconds? Now it's a problem, right? 
We don't have the computing hardware for that. So again, you have to scale horizontally. So velocity is a factor in this, right? How much do you have? How much do we have to look at? And how fast do you need it back? Okay, full self-driving car, an enormous amount of data coming through, video getting processed now, and a decision has to be taken instantly. All right, you can't wait a week, you'll be dead. And no one's gonna wait a week, right? Like it's the, the factor's not there though, the parameters don't allow it. So you have to be able to respond very, very quickly. So velocity plays a factor in this. Another problem, and those of you who are in IT now will see this all of the time, is variety, right? How will your system deal with different types of data as the types approach infinity? Another way to say that is, how are you gonna deal with change? Good Lord, ETL. How many of you had to deal with ETL? Extraction, transform, and loading. Oh my God. So like the first five years of my professional career, all I was doing is moving data from one system to another. And I was like, there must be more. This, this can't be what we did all this for. But that's really what's happened. So many of us are just moving data from one system to another. Okay. And the reason for that is the, the systems are so structured. And I love structure. But to everything, there's a sweet spot. Not enough structure, you can't figure anything out. Too much structure, when things change, everything falls down. Or you'll never get off the ground. So there's sweet spots, right? There's sweet spots to these curves. These things, most things are curves. And so uh, curves with diminishing returns. Okay, so how do you build a system that allows you to change uh, and still have the velocity requirements. ETL systems like warehouses, if you're dealing with a data warehouse, how many of you have had to wait months for the warehouse to be updated with the correct format of data? Okay, great. So you waited months, now you got the format of data, but guess what? The, the, this, the field has changed underneath you. The virus is mutated. The cancer has mutated. It's a totally different thing now. And the data I'm looking at is out of date. This is useless, right? So relevance is definitely, uh, uh, time is a factor of relevance. So it's, it's almost better to have less accurate data, but have it in a timely fashion. ETL is traditionally slow. Too much structure leads to bottlenecks. So we have to have a sweet spot. So how are you gonna deal with that, okay? And veracity is, as all these things are happening, the variety is changing underneath you, the volume is increasing underneath you, everybody's coming to ask for it, how are you gonna maintain accuracy? How do you do it, right? How, do, how does Google, who has the world's data, make sure that the index doesn't get corrupted? There have been situations. There have been situations where you've done searches and things that should not have come back have come back. Microsoft turned on one of their chatbots and let it run in the wild and it turned into you know, uh, something very bad. <laughs> okay, so how do you how do you intervene? And there are you know the, the field is changing. There are, there are uh, um, some attacks we have for these things, uh, and you know, uh, you know very quickly in the interest of time, volume is solved by using perpetual storage in the cloud, right? Or maybe on your um, in your lab you have the ability to store enormous amounts of data. Okay, but the cloud effectively is indefinite for volume. Right? They'll just keep adding servers, they can virtualize it out. Velocity, again, you have to be able to have processing that runs in parallel, not just for the data, but for the processing, solved by systems like Spark, um, DAS, right? I'll actually show you a quick DAS demo. I, I love DAS, okay? Um, and, uh, um, you know, so you, you have these you have these distributed systems that allow you to spread the memory out and processing out so that you can function at uh, the velocity requirements. Okay, so Spark, Dask, these were built for these things. Okay? Um, variety, how is that solved? Instead of being highly structured, we've actually taken a step back in time. Right, what we do now is we use these things called data lakes, and not even data lakes, just CSV files. Right, so before everything had to go in a database. I love databases, everybody loves databases. The problem is getting things into that database is painful. Painful, the, the term you'll hear is schema on write. Nobody's getting any data until the schema for this data is perfected and has been written to a database. Nobody's getting anything, okay? And so, okay, that's great, but I need the data now. 
or I don't want to wait six months for it. The patient's dying, right? Like, what are we going to do? Okay, so what ends up happening is rather than having a perfect schema, we start ha having redundancy and we have folders on these cloud machines. We, in AWS, we refer to them as S3, these, these uh, S3 buckets. We have these folders. And what we say is, you know what? We're not going to say anything about the internal structure of the data, but all the cancer files are going to go in this folder. And, and that format may change. Okay, but all the cancer files are going over here and all the files on COVID are going over here. And, you know, and, and so we have this minimal structure. There's still structure, but there's this minimal structure that allows us to be able to get at this data without it having to go through perfect execution of ETL, right? All things have diminishing returns. Too much structure means we're never going to get off the ground. So we have reduced back to this idea of Let's just impose minimal structure. We'll have some redundancy, but we'll still be able to get off the ground, okay? And stay in the air. And the last one, veracity, one of my favorites, this is the one I end up dealing with most often. So how do we keep the data sharp? There's two answers right now. First, we hire human beings. Human beings are very much in the loop of keeping data sharp, okay? You can get a job as a data labeler right now at Tesla. You can get a job working on Google's index right now. Right? They need people to still look at these things because we have context. We have access to variables and sensors that the machines do not have yet. Right? That's the first one. Second thing is we use anomaly detection. So if you can't look at everything, you look at that which is most egregious and work backwards. Right? And anomaly detection, they're pretty good algorithms for it. So what we do is we look for things that are way out of the norm. And then we start with those. And then we reduce those out. Is it real? Is it an anomaly? If it's real, then we have to update how we model the phenomena. If it's an anomaly, we discard it. And then we work our way back down to you know, things that are more and more normal. But these are things that normally don't have to occur in systems, right? But, and, and certainly, you could not have humans looking at all those anomalies because there's too many data points. So AI itself is, is emerging and being used heavily in the veracity section. There's no way we can spot all the anomalies, right? You know, trillions of records, how, right? And where will you draw the line? Anomaly detections can, can be totally unsupervised and find these things. So, um, okay. So, um, you know, that is at a high level, right? Volume, I'm running short on time and I wanna give you a demo. Uh, velocity, how are you gonna go as things go quick, as the requests coming quickly, variety. How do you avoid the ETL? I'm telling you, if you've not done ETL, it's terrible. Uh, it might be cool the first 10 times, but when you find that that's all you're doing as you're trying to publish your research, you will find that it's not fun, okay? So we've basically done everything we can to get rid of the ETL. Data science is doing everything it can to get rid of the statistics and mathematics that we had to do internally. And AI is doing everything it can to get rid of the programmers, right? And slowly and steadily, we're becoming more and more efficient by eliminating you know, manual processes. And hopefully that helps, um, uh, hopefully that helps humanity, okay? Um, the difference between a typical Linux or Linux file system and S S3 object storage. Uh, I mean, S3 is backed by HDFS, which is usually backed on Linux. So it's not much different, right? Like you can upload whatever you want to these file systems. Um, so we CSVs, file folders, whatever. The big difference is that S3 is um, distributed and um, uh, fault tolerant and indefinite, right? You can map S3 folders to either Linux or Windows as well. There's a way to sh it shows up as a drive. And they're effectively shared folders in the sky with good backups and indefinite storage capabilities. It's the same thing, right? Um, Okay, so variety, and then the last thing, veracity. You know, how do we um, detect these things with anomaly detection? All right now, let me show you something. Hopefully, I can pull off this demo very quickly. So, uh, <clears throat> what we have is, uh, let me see if I have this page up. So, I'll show you a quick example of Dask. Okay, because there's many things I want to show you, and I'll be back later in the curriculum. Uh, to talk with you more in depth about all of this. But um, one thing that I want to show you is a big data system in action, right? 
And so let me show you where the client is. So what happens, right? We have, um, it's here, okay. Let me pull this page up. Oh, and I have dark reader on. Let me turn dark reader off. Okay, so what happens is in big data systems, you can imagine each of these is its own server, okay? And here are the tasks that have been running. And what we do is not only do we spread the tasks out amongst these different systems. Uh, oh, the screen's not visible? I'm sorry. Can, uh, can, William, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. You see the, the graphs? Yeah. Everybody sees the, the green and the reds? Good, okay. Um, so it may just be lag, Kamala, or Kamala, I'm sorry. So, um, okay, what happens? Imagine each of these rows as being a server and each of these little blips, uh, these, these rectangles as being processes, okay? So we spread not only the processing out, but we spread the data out. I can only see the PowerPoint. Yeah, I think, I think we've, seen, we've seen something else. We've seen the veracity. So right, let me close this. Uh -huh. Let's see if the. Yeah, yeah, and I think you you selected your veracity uh, screen, so it, it it wants you to save it. All right, yeah, let me close this. Yeah, it's taking a second. Yeah. All right, what do you see now? Do you see my browser by chance or no? Uh, we we just see your okay. We see your dog now. Yeah, so the browser. Yeah. Oh, you see the browser? Okay, good. Yes. All right. So there might be just some lag. Okay. Mm -hmm. So everybody sees the green and red now. All right, we see yourself with the with your background. <laughs> uh, looks like they closed the window. All right. Let me close this. Let me open this window again. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Thanks, William. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. All right. How about now? Yeah, it's coming. I think it's. Yeah. Now we see. Now. Now we see a plot. Yes. Great. Okay. Yeah. All right. So imagine each of these rows as being a, a distributed server that you have access to. And what we've done is we now have the ability to share the computing power uh, of these um, uh, servers as if they're local to you. It's as if you're on a supercomputer and we can share. So we have the ability to share the CPU power and we have the ability to share the memory. So what was just a 16 gig laptop is now you know able to sit on a hundred gig of memory and 50, 60 cores of processing, okay? And so um, I'll just run this notebook. Give me a second, I have the, the kernel has to catch up. Almost there, I promise, yeah. Let me reload it, yeah. And what will happen is, is you'll see um, the processing, assuming everything starts working again, you'll see the processing start flying across the screen. And it's one of the more beautiful things you, at least I think happen in computer science, but let's see if I can pull this off in time. I'm not sure um, why it's taking so long. Let me look and see if there's an issue with computing. I can always restart the notebook. Uh, okay, it's reloading. Any questions as we go through? We'll make it, I'm optimistic, yeah. Okay, I see the chat window that came through. Um, is it running on VS Code? I'm running in Jupyter. But VS Code uses Jupyter internally. Databricks uses Jupyter internally. Google Collab, AWS SageMaker use Jupyter internally. So Jupyter like runs things, runs things. Okay, so we won't have time to go through all of what this is, but I'm going to run it. And it basically builds a decision tree um, predicting uh, Tesla stock prices uh, based on certain factors. Did, did it go up given the earnings reports, right? This is one of the notebooks 
uh, that we have and that we'll look at as the curriculum goes on. And so this thing should be running. Let me see. Yeah, it's running. And let's see if Dask is doing stuff. At some point, this window should start moving. Let me just refresh so that it maybe it hasn't reached the client yet. That's definitely running. This has to just load up again. So we'll see. It's always so close. Yeah. Let me see where we are in the notebook. Okay. And so we're running. Let me see if I can open a new window. Maybe that will render faster. Let's get a client. And this is the task graph. So it also tells you like what it's going to do, right? So you can see things are automatically being done in parallel for us, which is another uh, fantastic aspect of um, big data computing. So let's see here, here, that's coming up now. There's the link. Let's see if this opens. I'll close this one. It may be taking a second. My resources may be running low. Okay, there's the UI. Okay, so you see all this crunching? I'm glad we made it. Okay, so that is a gigantic data set being parallelized and run across multiple servers for you. Right. So you can see like these read CSVs have happened, the assignment, the do train, tis, uh, train, train test splits happened for you. And all of this, which would have been on a single processor, single computer, which you have to multiply this time by four, was split up for you. Right. So there are enormous tools that you can use to help you as you break through uh, with big data and data science. Uh, Spark and Dask. I like both of them. OK, any questions? It's been lovely meeting you all. Um, if let me turn this over to John. If you need me for anything, um, you can reach me at frame at umd.edu, right? Um, or you can reach out to the VADSD staff. And I wish you all the best. And I hope that you make incredible breakthroughs in data science and AI. Somebody find the cure for autism. You know, I hope I hope or, or or you know find solutions to all these problems and um, pass it on. You know, the more people we have working in the field, uh, automating these processes and, and blasting through these data sets, the better it is for humanity. I wish you all the best, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you so, you so much, much uh, Professor Satra. I my you give excellent uh, presentation uh, on, on top, top of this. this. I know, I know you, you can't see me somehow. somehow. Uh, something, something happened, happened to my video has turned, turned on, so, so I'm, I'm here. here. So, so again, again, thank, thank you for a great overview of data, data science uh, as a trend in the set. You go back the last two weeks to give, give details, details of many, many of the terms that we uh, gave an uh, uh, overview uh, uh, of. Uh, if, uh, you if you haven't uh, completed the, the, the evaluation, evaluation, you can, can see, see the learning. Dr. Equation, Dr. Equation, you're yeah, echoing, yes. you're echoing, you're 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 echoing really bad. I don't think people can understand you. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so so is it better? better? No, it's not better. Your this your microphone is echoing. Uh, this has a lot of feedback and it's echoing really bad. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know, know what, what is going on. Uh, 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 William, William, can, can you, you uh, maybe turn down the podcast and then for the week? <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. John, uh, Professor John, and uh, Professor uh, 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 Prem for, for the great presentation. And uh, for students, please uh, note we normally do offer office hours uh, or TA session, and the TA session for uh, for this model, I mean for these two days, will be uh, tomorrow at six to seven p.m. Eastern, that's New York time or Washington D.C. time. We don't have a concession as to what time works would work best for you. So the assumption is that 
uh, is going to be 6 p.m. If for some reason it, the time doesn't work, uh, just send the organizers an email, just send an email to Stacy or just post it on, on, on Slack and uh, we'll try and adjust the time. But thank you very much and uh, uh, thanks for the great session again, Professor uh, uh, Prime. And we look forward to the next modules. Okay, so it's back to you, uh, John, uh, Nana, uh, and uh, Stacy. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would just say this again. again, again I, don't I don't know if it's still, still so bad, 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 bad. We can not hear you, Dr. Quajan. It's still echoing. So it's still, still okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a really cool auto tune, you know? <laughs> Okay, so Stacy, maybe you want to you want to add uh, a few uh, a few points that I may have missed. Uh, the, uh, we we need a survey, right? We need a survey. Yes, the survey has Trump. been posted in Slack, um, and it's and is pinned in Slack. It's also been posted here several times in the chat. Please take a moment to fill out the survey for module one before leaving class today. Also, once we have office hours um, figured out, they will be posted under the office hours channel in Slack. And as far as recordings go for um, day one and day two, they will be posted over the weekend in Slack. You can find the modules for each, you can find the recordings, excuse me, for each module located under module one, module two, module three, module four, et cetera, as each module goes along. And they'll be posted the, follow, the weekend following. So usually between Saturday and Sunday, following today's class, it'll be posted um, to, and you can get to the YouTube link where you can see everything um, after the modules. Um, if you have any questions, um, I will post the email in the chat that we can be reached at. It's vasti at howard.edu. And if you have any other questions, uh, please let us know. Um, tokens for Codeo, they should be found in the instructions that were sent to you um, for day one and day two for this module. And if anyone has any further questions, um, always refer to Slack. And if not Slack, then Basti at howard.edu. Yes. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, and actually, I just want to say one last thing. Um, it's incredibly important to be connected with each other. Right? It opens doors. You never know when you'll need somebody else. So um, please feel free to send me a, a LinkedIn uh, request. You know, I'm happy to connect with all of you and try to connect with your classmates. Right, it's a small world, and um, the more we work together, the better. So I wish you all the best. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. On the email that was sent to us for the cordio, um, there is no talking on it. Is there somewhere else or another email that was sent out I didn't know about? Uh I will send a mail to. Yeah, if you want to send it, uh, if you want to send an email to Basti um, at Howard at Edu, um, I'll post Basti, that in the can chat. Can you type it in yeah, on the chat, please? Uh, we'll, I, I will post them in the chat. Okay, thank you. So, if you want to send an email, I will forward that to the appropriate person who can help you. Oh yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you. Uh, some of you tomorrow at eight. Remember, it's six p.m. to seven p.m. Uh, at six p.m. to seven p.m. and uh, that's New York time. And if it doesn't work, please just send a mail to uh, the email provided and suggest an alternative time. Thank you. Uh, the TA uh, Zoom will be posted in Slack as well for those who are interested.